In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Today we commemorate St. Paul. It is the feast of the commemoration of St. Paul, which occurs after the feast of Saints Peter and Paul, which we celebrated yesterday. And St. Paul is always before us in the epistles of the Mass, but very seldom do we hear about him. He was, by nature, a man of extreme choleric character which means that he was drawn by nature to do difficult and great tasks despite danger and risk. St. Paul also was a man of no half measures. He did completely what he did and he thought completely what he thought. St. Stephen and he were friends. They were both in the school of the Pharisees, learning to be good Pharisees. And when St. Stephen converted to Christianity, that so enraged St. Paul, who still perceived Judaism as the true faith that he himself as it says in sacred scripture consented to the stoning of St. Stephen for stoning was by the law of Moses the crime the punishment of the crime of heresy and there he looked upon his friend that he knew and consented to the throwing of stones upon him watching him bleed to death because of what he perceived to be the heresy of St. Stephen because he overcame all of his feeling because of his faith That's St. Paul. And we know that he had a very unusual conversion. Filled with indignation against Christ, he went to Damascus to persecute the church. And we understand the character of St. Paul by the way in which God converted him. He appeared to him in a great flash of light and threw him off of his horse and blinded him and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he remained blind for days. And he went to Damascus blind, helpless, until finally, by the revelations that God gave him during this time, he converted to the Catholic faith. We have seen this type of conversion many times in the history of the saints, not exactly this type, but we see that God converts people according to their character and according to the vices and the virtues that they have. St. Francis Borgia, for example, was a very worldly person. But when he saw the body of Isabella, the, the queen, laid out, who had been a very beautiful woman, he was so horrified by the thought of death and by the shortness of life that by the grace of God he was pulled away from his worldliness and became a very, very mortified saint. St. Paul is, of course, filled with virtue. There is no virtue you could mention that he did not have. But there are certain particular virtues that stand out in St. Paul as a Catholic, as a bishop, and as an apostle. 
The first is his unstoppable zeal for the salvation of souls. He went all over the empire into small towns and big towns to Jews and to Gentiles. Nothing stopped him from preaching the Holy Gospel. He had no care of human respect. He did not care if he was run out from towns and stoned and left for dead. He did not care that three times he underwent shipwreck. He went on and on and on because of this zeal, this drive that was in him by the grace of God perfecting his nature. He says in his epistle, Who then shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or famine or nakedness or danger or persecution or the sword? None of these things would stop him from his pursuit of the love of Christ, the zeal for the salvation of souls. And to young Timothy, whom he consecrated a bishop, he said, I charge thee before God and Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead by his coming and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, retreat, <clears throat> rather, uh, reprove and treat, rebuke in all patience and doctrine, for there shall come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and will indeed turn away their hearing from the truth and will be turned unto fables. But be thou vigilant, labor in all things, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill thy ministry, be sober, for I am even now ready to be sacrificed, and the time of my dissolution is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Listen to the fire in those words the fire of zeal for the salvation of souls and for the preaching of the Holy Gospel. The second great virtue that we see in St. Paul is his uncompromising and clear presentation of Catholic truth. He says in, in the first epistle to the Corinthians, to the Corinthians who have accepted the Gospel but who have not given up impurity. He says, Know you not that the unjust shall not possess the kingdom of God? Do not err. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor liars with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor railers, nor extortioners, shall possess the kingdom of God. That is the way that the Catholic Church speaks. It does not speak in the murky mush that you hear from the Novus Ordo. Would that those words were said at the meeting of the Novus Ordo bishops who could not figure out what to do with those men who are consecrated to, supposedly, the salvation of souls when they pervert the very meaning of their existence. Who took days and days to figure out what St. Paul says in a sentence and still couldn't get it straight. That is the way the Catholic Church teaches with clear and uncomprom uncompromising truth. St. Paul also had an intense contempt for worldliness. 
He said, furthermore, I count all things to be but loss for the excellent knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but as dung that I may gain Christ. We need the virtues of St. Paul, the multiplication of material things in this world is a part of the devil's general plan for the preparation of the world for Antichrist. And unfortunately, Catholics have been sucked in and have lost their zeal, and we need the zeal of St. Paul. And the obscuring of the truth is another characteristic of our age. I read recently a short article entitled The Real Abusers. And it is commenting on the immorality of the Catholic clergy. And this man says that the real abuse is not confined to relatively few immoral priests. Rather, it goes on day by day in all of the institutions of what is perceived to be the Catholic Church. Every day, it goes on in parishes and universities and schools every day by thousands and thousands of clergymen. And what is this abuse? It is the relativization of truth. It is to deprive our children of the truth, which is an abuse far worse than the abuse of their bodies. And how right he is. Listen to what he says. We have relativized truth. We tell our young people in so many words that there is no such thing as right and wrong. We say that all religions are valid, that all value systems have equal potential for working. Our state educational systems from preschool all the way through our big universities are rooted in such pluralistic doctrine. Even much of private education buys into the same thinking. And the media, the same ones whose newscasters cheer for anything that makes a church look bad, spend the rest of their time indoctrinating their listeners that there is that there really is nothing ultimately good or bad and our young people have believed it by the millions and by the tens of millions they have believed it but when you plant doubts about absolute truth and when you teach children that there is only a shadowy difference between right and wrong, and when you promote relativism as a false god, then you've done something far, far worse than abusing little children's bodies and psyches. Now you've stripped them of their consciences as well. Go ask the gentle Jesus, who took little ones into his loving arms, what he would do with people who abuse children in that way. And he is referring to the quote of our Lord that it would be better that a millstone be tied around your neck and that you be thrown into the depths of the sea than that you scandalize one of these little ones he calls for capital punishment. And who wrote these words? A Protestant. 
a Protestant. How sad it is that the condition of the Catholic Church has come so low. The Church founded upon St. Peter and St. Paul has come so low that not one single person who claims to be the successor of St. Peter and St. Paul, that is, the Novus Ordo bishops, can say this, but that we must hear this from a Protestant. How low we have sunk. And so we need the virtues of St. Paul. We need the power of the blood of St. Paul. By his blood, Rome was consecrated to the Holy Gospel. May his blood be now upon the false teachers in that city, false teachers whom St. Paul calls, in his direct and clear way, dogs, dogs, and enemies of the cross of Christ, he calls them. May his blood descend upon them and drive them out of the holy places which are consecrated to the unchanging truths of the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.